Hi everyone. Uh, today, uh, this is Otto Lee. Uh, today, we're very honored to have a very special guest. Uh, her name is Sarah Fernando. She's the Chief Diversity Officer of Silicon Valley Pride. We just took place and uh, we would like to uh, welcome. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? I'm doing great, Otto. How are you? Very, very well. So, uh, the Silicon Valley Pride this year is literally a little bit different uh, with the COVID situation. We really can't be out there uh, uh, as we normally are. It's always a very exciting times every year. So tell us, how, how did it go this year and what should we, uh, any takeaways about it? Yeah, well, Silicon Valley Pride, and this is our 45th celebration, so it was supposed to be a huge deal for us. Um, but with shelter in place orders, uh, we were able to transition our um, Silicon Valley Pride Festival to two days and full, two full days of uh, Pride celebration. And what's great about it is that the, the look and feel of Silicon Valley on the virtual platform was actually the same way it would um, flow if this were an in-person event. So um, what's spectacular about this year's celebration is that we were able to uh, find new artists, mm -hmm. uh, promote artists that we had before, and we were able to um, have a greater sense of diversity in terms of the performance artists that we had, as well as something for everyone. And that's what I love about Silicon Valley Pride is that not only is it family friendly, but there's something if you're femme identified, there's something if you're trans, non-binary or gender non-conforming identified, if you are a parent of LGBTQ, or if you have kids that are LGBTQ or anything like that, it's it was really a great event to see and, and what I love loved about the virtual platform this year is that I was just so overwhelmed by how popular certain events were. So uh, believe it or not, a lot of our Zoom events, the, the, those one-time events were the most populated and from a dance party to a cultural celebration. Um, to our, even our drag brunch, it was the biggest drag brunch we've had so far on a virtual platform. Uh, there was just so much overwhelming response from the community itself. Um, and it was just a full, almost 48 hours of entertainment similar to what we do on, you know, in person. So it was delightful to see and um, it, it was just a great experience overall. And I mean, I guess people just have to get very creative, right, to try to find these socially distanced uh, way to celebrate and spread the, the good news and the message of how important these past 45 years has been for celebrating pride. And obviously, the, from the very get go, uh, it was uh, you know, kind of considered out there and it was not accepted by the mainstream. And nowadays, of course, is very much well accepted. And the journey, the yeah. 45 years only has gone through so much, including, of course, the uh, getting rid of the Defense of Mar Marriage Act, uh, legalizing gay marriage. And of course, this year, very excitingly, we have the Supreme Court holding, basically, it was a 63 holding, actually, that extended the LGBTQ uh, benefits uh, to as a discrimination and to all agenda. And that's really, really huge. Um, yeah. That came down, I remember. And I actually did remember uh, right when that issue came through, uh, I was attending the rally uh, for the Black Trans Life Matter uh, yeah. at, uh, in San Jose, right at the, I believe, the Frank uh, Center. Uh, and you were the MC. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah that, was, that was quite an event, especially given that, that at that point, certainly the COVID is you know, more disconcerting. And that so many people still were able to come. We certainly were trying to do as much as we can on the social distancing, that's hard, but everybody was clearly wearing a mask, very aware uh, and respecting everybody's space to make sure that, uh, but yet with so many hundreds of people actually showed up for that really, really important event. So kudos to all your hard work of making that happen uh, and with so many great speakers as well. And yeah. here with the audience as well, what, what you learned about that event as well? Yeah, I mean, what I learned about that event and specifically my work in advocacy mm -hmm. and activism is really supporting the most marginalized community members 
of the uh, queer and trans communities. And right now, there's so much attention that needs to happen with uh, the, the amount of black and brown transgender lives lost due to anti-trans, you know, like just this whole ideology uh, of trans folks not, shouldn't be existing in this world. It's, it's so ridiculous to me to the point where me as a out and visible trans person of color existing in the space, even I identify as a trans person of color, but I do not get victimized or brutalized the same way black and brown trans folks do. And there was something that was missing, I felt personally, with uh, some of the Black Lives Matters movements where names like Tony McDade and Lilian Polanco, at the time, Rhea Milton, uh, Nina Pop, those names weren't amplified as much as um, the names that you hear in the Black Lives Matter movement. And it, don't get me wrong, I, I wholeheartedly support the Black Lives Matter movement, but if there's anything that we can do to elevate uh, the amount of brutalization and victimization that the, the Black and Brown trans community members um, get, it has to be amplified. And um, luckily, I have the support of a lot of the folks that uh, are active in the, the Black Lives Matter movement that want to also elevate those voices. So wherever I could lend my expertise, I will. And if it means doing a march, a rally, a protest, um, I will make sure to do that. Um, and uh, it's great to hear um, from where we started at when um, Black Lives Matter um, fired up again. Yes, that's right. To hear the, the, the trans, uh, Black Trans Lives Matter mm -hmm. cries and chants in these movements, it, it's, it's overwhelming for me to hear, especially locally here in San Jose. Exactly. And because, well, as we all know, with George Floyd uh, really giving the walk to the nation of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, I, I think it also helped give rise, in this case, to the Black Trans Life movement, because uh, it's the one uh, area of the top of marginalized, the, 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 what would say, the, the most marginalized community there is. And there's just so much ignorance. Uh, so much uh, of the, the, you could say, fake news or fake information out there that people just don't understand. And I think it's so important to make sure that uh, people are being exposed and educated. As we all grew up knowing that, you know, people don't grow up to be bigots, right? Mm -hmm. This is learned. So which means that there's been so much of these, quote unquote, bad learning. Uh, people have uh, gone through media, through yeah. school, friends uh, that needs to be uh, uh, needs to be rectified on the, on those lines. so that's why the education part of it is so crucial and important to make sure and I think at the uh, at, uh, not just the, the schools has a role to it but certainly you know educating the the, the older generations as well uh, to understand how important it really is and at the end of the day it's about human rights mm -hmm. people's uh, 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 right to love uh, and this is something so basic that uh, it's not really something people think is, is anti-religious. As a matter of fact, religion that I know is already teaching about love. And I think if anything, uh, this, is, this is something that everybody really need to understand to embrace at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, you know, when, when you say that, the one thing that also feel is important is uh, visibility and representation. And this is where I feel that when we do these kind of events that amplify the voices of trans folks, black trans lives, brown trans lives, we bring up the issues and we have trans leaders um, that are speaking and picking up the microphone and telling their story. I feel that that's what's gonna bring up equity because it's one thing to hear about trans folks, but it's another thing to hear the stories from trans trans folks personally, in person. Um, this is where like right now we are at an awesome time in terms of uh, trans representation in the media. It's elevated and I love it, but we just need to do more because we need to have trans people represented not only in movies and TV, um, which is great and phenomenal in terms of visibility, but if there's any way that we could bring up the stories of 
all trans folks, hearing about their journeys and seeing their successes as well as their challenges. We could learn so much from a beautiful, diverse, intersectional community. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and you know, that's one thing great about the Silicon Valley is that uh, diversity is truly is something very much part of our valley. When we came from an agricultural background, we call the heart, valleys of hard delights, and then you have the uh, technology and defense, right? Uh, again, yeah. I was kind of you know, winding down the Moffett Field is no longer an, even a military base, is now NASA. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> high tech uh, has taken over, but at the same time, with the uh, immigrant community moving in with so many people working in the high tech field. And of course, we have folks who are coming here working as well in the agricultural area as well. So you have the intersection uh, of different uh, ethnic background, different uh, countries that we come from. Really is amazing. For some people would like to use the word melting pot, but it's just a, 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 a uh, 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 this this mixture of, of cultures that we have is amazing. And I don't know, Sarah, you probably know uh, one thing I'm very excited about is food and the amount of food uh, choices we have. You know, isn't it difficult? Oh, yeah. It's like, hmm, what do you want to eat, right? And that's <laughs> Valley is such a great place to live. Yeah, in terms of food, what's funny is that people don't understand how big the food culture is in the South Bay. Like a lot of people believe that the best food's in San Francisco. And it's just like, every time I go to San Francisco, I can't think of one favorite restaurant, maybe a couple. <laughs> but in terms of just like the food that's here in, in the South Bay, in terms of just like, uh, I, I don't think I could get better uh, Mexican food or Vietnamese food other than Silicon Valley. It, it's, it's right here and all these kind of like food fusions and just people passionate about food. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm a lover and connoisseur of milk tea and what? I love being in, in Silicon Valley because I feel that we just have the most, yeah. <laughs> most variety. Very, very, uh, just, it's funny you mentioned that. I was just picking up this uh, place called, that has this dirty tea. Um, ah. It's dirty tea, but of course it's just a tea mixed with the milk and the yeah. milk. Very pretty, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, I even have my, my tea right over here. So I already went before this. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Now, um, so now that the Silicon Valley Pride has just been celebrated, uh, so what would you say are our next steps? Obviously, it was a great, you know, we say four days of partying and, and socially distance wise, that's great. But obviously, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, what exactly would you say are your uh, uh, biggest priority you think we need to uh, do uh, immediately now? Yeah, well, what's great about Silicon Valley Pride as an organization, and, and this is something that's very, uh, not necessarily new, but something that we've been challenged with. And um, even when I came to the, the executive board for Silicon Valley Pride, my biggest challenge is what we're going to do to elevate the, the voices of trans folks, of non-binary folks, of people of color. Uh, what are we going to do, even women, like women identified folks, what do we do to do to build community? create voice, create space, create access uh, to empower everyone to live authentically uh, in the South Bay. So granted that, you know, Silicon Valley Pride was a, a splendid weekend, our work is never going to be done uh, mm -hmm. because even with um, Silicon Valley Pride being that one myopic event, the, the marginalization, victimization, brutalization, inequities, and um, social justice issues that continue to affect the LGBTQI plus community is still happening. It's something that's year round. So my challenge is really to see what we could do to um, create community, uh, amplify those voices, and make sure that Silicon Valley Pride is not only a celebration platform, Mm -hmm. but also a platform for advocacy uh, for the communities that we wish to represent. Um, I, I just think of the phrase, uh, no pride celebration for some of us without uh, liberation for all of us. And at its core, um, that's what pride really means. So uh, in September, this September, uh, we'll be celebrating uh, by Visibility Day to celebrate our bisexual community. Uh, we'll have events for LGBTQ History Month in October. I'm pretty sure you'll probably hear about me coming back with some form of advocacy work uh, with uh, the uh, 
uh, transgender, um, transgender Day of Remembrance that happens on November 20th. Um, then in December, we normally have our big LGBTQ party, uh, but because we're in this shelter in place situation, it will probably be virtual, but this is something that is not just in August for us or even in June. This is something that happens to have, that happens to be year round and whatever I could do to leverage my, um, my title as diversity officer, I make sure to use that as um, a way for me to get access to any kind of platform to talk about Black trans lives, brown trans lives, marginalized LGBTQ folks, and the issues LGBTQI folks face within the community mm -hmm. uh, and worldwide. So this is where I feel that Pride is a great way, and this is, I always say this, Pride is a great way to get allies. It's pretty much rush <laughs> for allyship uh, to be able to get more allies um, invested and involved and hopefully more LGBTQ community members. But at the same time, how do we get those allies to be in this fight for equity? So um, this, is, this is something that's year round and that's why I chose to be uh, involved, heavily involved with Silicon Valley Pride as well as other groups. That's great. Now, uh, one other issue I want to talk about is, as you know, I have served 28 years in the military, in the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with the military in 2010, uh, early, uh, yeah. 2010 is when President Obama was able to uh, sign into law, allowing uh, LGBT members to serve openly in the U.S. military, <clears throat> which is, of course, extremely historic, to get rid of the former don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, but of course, uh, recently, uh, the current president and occupant of the White House, shall we say, uh, is trying to not allow transgenders to serve in the military. And of course, has been getting a lot of backlash on it. Uh, what have you learned about that? And what, are, what more do we need to do to make sure that rights, uh, that transgender, that the best people that's you know, willing and able to serve should be doing those uh, work? Yeah, I would say with this current administration, the way I feel as a transgender woman is uh, whenever any kind of federal or executive order comes out uh, mm -hmm. from the current administration, it's meant to belittle, bully, marginalize the most marginalized communities. And it happens to be transgender folks. And considering that trans uh, equity has been um, within the spotlight, I would say for the last five years. Um, so because we make up around 2%, 2 percent, 2 to 4 percent of folks nationwide, it's, we're an easy target. And when I first heard the news around three years ago about the trans military ban, I was, I was very distraught over it because like I was just thinking, how could they do this? Uh, why pick on us? Where trans folks that actively serve are the best and the brightest, especially like, uh, like up and down, I have, uh, folks that I know that were actively serving. I know folks that um, are done with their service um, that are just such phenomenal people. And they have every right to serve just as any other member. And to say that transgender people are a burden based on medical, you know, medical uh, necessities, uh, you know, that, that trans folks need to be able to live authentically, it's, it's ludicrous considering that we, again, only make up maybe one to two percent. <laughs> so I, I just feel that trans folks are the ones on the front lines, willing, able to protect this country at all costs. Um, and by all costs, I mean, making sure that we protect the people of the United States of America and to marginalize and disclude trans folks in the military. And, and, and it's been happening in waves, right? Not only was the trans military ban, but there was also um, 
the uh, Title IX that was released um, that allows uh, healthcare providers to discriminate against trans folks. And there was also federal order allowing um, public shelters to also discriminate against trans folks. These are things to belittle the trans community to the point where we're going to be since, in the sense erasure, erased from kind of like society. But you go into the protests, you go into the rallies, you go into the space of activism, you'll see nothing but queer and trans people fighting the fight on the front lines, be it in the military or any kind of active protest. And it doesn't have to be just LGBTQ related. They are there for Black Lives Matter and they are there because like, and, and this is what I love about bringing it back to Pride. Pride started as a riot. Pride started as a way to say something against the, the police brutality, uh, police discrimination against LGBTQ people. Um, this is something where it's, it's, I feel that it's just in our blood. So uh, knock us down and we'll come back even stronger. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. And as we said, we want the best people to serve and people who are willing to give up a life, basically, right? When you serve in the military, yeah. uh, that's the type of sacrifice that's unparalleled. And obviously, uh, we do have many LGBTQ members that I have served with, even in Iraq uh, at the time, um, even though it wasn't openly uh, available. But, you know, you do know who they are, many of them, but you served long enough with them. Uh, and some of the best people we've ever been able to meet. And I'm so honored to have the opportunity to do so uh, in my years there. Um, in the meantime, I would say uh, a really amazing uh, work this year for Silicon Valley Pride. Good job. Thank and you. Uh, keep up your great work. There's still so much work to do ahead of us. Um, and uh, of course, we do have November, so that if we could actually help uh, get that occupant change in the White House would be a good start of making uh, a lot of the needed changes instead of going backwards, we'll move forward from here onwards. Yeah, Great. agree. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Sarah, for joining with us today. Time goes by really quickly. Yeah. We enjoy our little conversation here. And uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you, Otto. It's been a pleasure.